Hi, my name is John Zalay, and this is First National Antiques Restoration, Barnegat, New Jersey. This is all my crap. Hi. I've been in business since 1980. Uh, my focus here has been Rantic Restoration. Retail too, but mostly restoration. Recently I've gotten more into restoration than retail. I closed the shop about seven years ago and devoted folk, uh, mainly just on antique restoration work and uh, you know, just making a living at doing what I love to do. This is all part of it. Antique motorcycles is a big part of my business. I love antique motorcycles. The, the passion that I have for antique motorcycles came from um, an early understanding of technology and the way that it plays an important part in the development of this country. Uh, the motorcycle, uh, you know, it's a sexy thing. It's one of the things that like keeps us going in life. It's one of the things we do for recreation. We always have. We've done it for transportation initially around the turn of the century. And that's what my focus was on, was really trying to see how early technology developed the bike first into bicycles, then into a motor, then into a motorized bicycle, then into a motorcycle, and getting all these, the story straight has been a, uh, a difficult thing to do. It's taken me 15, 20 years to have a collection together and understanding and the knowledge to really start to understand what is going on in the world of motorcycling and bicycling and early transportation. Um, how I funded all this is through my antique wood, refurnish, uh, wood refinishing business. It's a furniture refinishing business that started uh, when I was a very young boy. I was about 12, 14 years old that period. I just kind of realized that, yeah, I was really in, in, thrilled with cabinet making and how that whole went down, how everything was put together with wood and wooden objects and construction of, of furniture. And I actually moved out of my bedroom into my brother's bedroom and made my bedroom into a workshop. It was off the kitchen. We have a big family, six kids in our family. Uh, and it made my mother crazy. She was thought I was going to cut all my fingers off. And, you know, I had a table saw. And my dad was very supportive. He bought me a bandsaw and a shopsmith. And I was not even 15 years old yet. And this is one of the things that, um, you know, kept me going was understanding how furniture was put together, how it was built, and I wanted to create my own furniture. And I did that for a lot of years. Uh, through high school, I was uh, all about uh, commercial cabinet work, doing custom furniture. I had uh, high school teachers who were hiring me to build pieces of furniture for them, and that was my high school employment. That's how I made money. Uh, my shop got pretty large. Uh, I moved into a shop on, on Wells Mill Road. I bought my dad's shop, Star Mowers. It wasn't large enough for me to really do anything with. So I bought this bank building in 1980. It came up for sale, and it's been a wonderful place. It's a 1914 bank building, and I've been here ever since doing it. Uh, it's been a fascinating ride. Uh, there's a lot of things that have been uh, gone through this shop as an antique shop. Uh, it looked different. This was all furniture, restored furniture, real high-end, real high-quality restored furniture. When I closed the antique shop part of it, the reason I did that was because it was so um, busy with the restoration, I just couldn't keep up with everything. I don't have any employees. I don't want any employees. I'm happy with the way things are. I'm real good at you know my scheduling and trying to keep everything together, and it works really, really well. So. I'm not about to change that. The, uh, the things that I like that come to my shop is early furniture. Early furniture and the way that it's constructed. Uh, American furniture has a very brief history in the big time scale of decorative objects or art. So, you know, we're, our country was settled and, uh, you know, 1620, 1630, you know, Things were starting to happen in here, uh, Jamestown settlement, the settlement in Virginia, and also things started happening up in Massachusetts, and 
uh, commerce started to happen, and and from then furniture had to be developed to make people's uh, lives more complete. But it's really it's like 300 years of history where, on the global scale, Europe has a 3,000, 4,000 year history of furniture. America has a really, really small window. It makes American furniture that much rarer, that much more uh, uh, expensive. So uh, my focus is always on early American furniture, and I sold a lot of it uh, all through the 80s, 90s, into the early 1000s, 2000s, turn of the century, and I just, it was enough. I just wanted to quit what I was doing, and uh, wanted to focus on really what I love. My passion is restoration. Turn the whole antique shop into this motorcycle showroom you see here. This is all my parts and pieces, and there's customer bikes in here I've sold, and things that are gone. It's just, just some really, really interesting pieces. Right behind me here is a eight valve motor from 1912. This is an Indian racing motor, uh, which I'm just finishing up restoring um, for a customer's bike. Uh, here's the, the frame, which I just finished. Uh, it had to be all straightened out. It actually was an erased frame and it got into a crash and got totally uh, twisted up. And I took it all apart, made it all straight again, put some new tubing in that had to be done, and just it's still it's the original racing, privateer racing frame. Here's the motors going in it. It's an overhead valve configuration, which is pretty rare and exotic for 1912. Think about that. Uh, the overhead valve for the cylinders. So there's actually flame coming out of the cylinders here and here. You see there's ports in the, on the top of these cylinders. The overhead valve, this is just, most technology was flathead construction where the valve sat in here. It was very, very crude. This was very, very uh, esoteric. It was real, really complicated um, way to operate a motorcycle engine. And, you know, everybody raced so they can develop their technology. All these early American motorcycle uh, companies raced so that they can put um, yourselves on the map. They, if you raced on Sunday, you sold on Monday. That was the, the whole deal. Getting these bikes together and make them go fast. You were showing off your company's skills, your technician skills, your engineering skills, your, the way that you could put a bike together again. Indian pioneered racing. They had amazing race technology. Um, and Oscar Hedstrom was the lead engineer and a brilliant, brilliant guy. He developed this engine as you see it, the Hedstrom uh, concentric float feed carburetor, which is super rare. I actually reproduced these carburetors here for customers who are uh, building replicas of these motors. And um, I, I make a small base carburetor and a big base carburetor, which is two styles on the same era. The, um, the way that this whole engine works is the valves are actually about these push rods, which are still installing push rods, and I'm going through the motor here now and just testing things. But the push rod here actually operates these rocker arms, which push these valves down, overhead valves, and make into the combustion chamber. It's a very efficient way to move the exhaust, burnt exhaust gases, and also the intake gases. It came in the same way. So, um, and this carburetor is big. It's Wide open throttle. This damn thing here is the throttle. Basically, you, you adjust this and you adjust this as the main jet. Open it up and mix the motor rock and roll. Going down the track, that's what you did. You, open, you, you, you reach down underneath you while you're doing 80 miles an hour on a board track full of splinters and you went and, and you twisted this knob and adjusted the feed in the carburetor and you adjusted the air intake this way and got the correct burn to make this engine really scream and rock and roll. Um, this was like a technological space shot of 1912 technology. This was like going to the moon we did in 1967. It was, or 69, I think it was. Anyway, this was part of the, part of uh, Indian's racing career and they were very successful in racing all the way through uh, their early teens up to about 1915 when Harley emptied into market and uh, they had a very successful run with their um, overhead valve banjo case motor uh, for 1915, and that was in Dodge City. And they cleaned the slate. Harley really came through. Indy continued racing, of course, and uh, Indy and Harley were competitors. And they went neck and neck throughout the years and kept uh, uh, other companies at bay. Excelsior, Henderson, um, Reading Standard, all these 
companies, there's probably in 1910, maybe 300 motorcycle manufacturers. By 1915, there was probably maybe, um, maybe half a dozen left. It really got sorted out very quickly in a, in a five or six year span. So uh, this is what I support. I have this is a, a 1911 Pope behind me over here. That's the first Pope motorcycle, basically. Uh, 1911 was the first year that Pope started getting involved with motorcycling, and they had built cars, and uh, that, that was actually a motorcycle, a motorcycle that was built by the Pope the Manufacturing Company in, um, in New York. Oh, no, Massachusetts, I'm sorry. The um, uh, other bikes I have in here, I've got a 1911 Harley Davidson, which I went cross country on uh, in 2010. It was on a motorcycle cannonball. We went um, about 40 guys stood together, all pre 1915 motorcycles, and we all, a bunch of crazy bastards, we went from Kitty Hawk to Santa Monica, California. And it was about 18 days of pure hell. Uh, motors breaking down constantly. I, I broke uh, connecting rods, two connecting rods going across country. Ended up making a connecting rod in the middle of nowhere from a forklift ride that some guy had uh, let me borrow. <laughs> um, we went to, and we went all the way across the country on all the way to Santa Monica through the Mojave Desert three days. Uh, it was amazing, amazing time. It's something I'll never forget. It was a really difficult thing to do. One of the, the most physically challenging things I ever had to do. Uh, and you didn't sleep. You kept going all damn day to ride your bike and fixing it and fixing it. And then you had to get in at night. These bikes didn't have lights. We weren't allowed to really ride at night. It was part of the, the deal that we had. Uh, set up beforehand with our group. And um, so we got back in and all we did all night long was fix your damn bike. We kept the bikes going by working on them all night. I'd be working till you know, daylight and at seven o'clock in the morning, man, that was the time I had to leave. That was our, our, our takeoff time for our class one bikes. Kept on going and it kept on going that for 18 days. It was a crazy, crazy time. Really was an interesting thing and a good learning experience. Made me a better restorer. I learned, understood more about the mechanics and what it really was like to ride one of these early bikes uh, back in the day and give me a better appreciation for what was going on. Um, I have uh, a whole other business we're going to get involved with and that's downstairs in my cabinet shop. Uh, that's part of, um, or that is the whole deal here. That keeps the whole thing running. We, or I restore maybe five or six pieces of furniture a month, uh, go on a 30-day basis, and it works pretty good. We're, I, I don't overbook myself. I book things out ahead of time, and uh, it works really well to keep the, the you know bank account going, paying the bills, and uh, everything like that. I, don't, I have a son. I've got two grandkids, uh, sisters, brothers. Um, like I said, we have a family of six. Mom's still alive. Dad's passed away maybe... 12 years now, a dozen years. Dad was an inspiration to me. He had a small injury repair shop and um, I was young at the time. It was North Jersey and I watched him um, run a business and that was really the inspiration that I had. Taking Dad's passion for even running a small business in this country. He was very successful. He came out of the Korean War and supported a family of six running a small business. And I've done the same thing. Uh, that was my uh, uh, passion in life also is to run another business and my passion was different than my dad's to start with. Uh, I was a woodworker and a cabinet maker where, and I later in life actually discovered mechanical objects and my dad would just go have a field day here now and he kind of passed away to see this happen before it really evolved totally. Uh, I mean I wasn't really into the antique motorcycles as much when he was alive but I did was into motorcycling my whole life. I always had a bike, always rode. Um, and still do, passion around her. Okay, well, um, I'm gonna cut here and then we're gonna go downstairs and talk about my business down there.
Hey, it's John again. Welcome to my workshop. I want to show you what was going on in the downstairs part of my business, which is my cabinet shop. This is where all the magic happens. Um, currently working on a couple different projects here. The uh, doors in the foreground are from 1850 or so. Uh, customer contacted me with a family project. They have a house, actually a railroad station. It was built around the turn of the century. A uh, local railroad station. And these are the doors that were inside the railroad station. It's pretty amazing. They were painted, you know, 10 coats of paint. Had a lot of repair, missing a lot of tons of molding. They were damaged beyond belief. And it's amazing what people do with their furniture or and their objects to make them work through the years. And these things were really, really beat up bad. Now they're coming back to life. Um, this is a project started uh, beginning of the month. Uh, working pretty hard on it. Had to have the doors, you know, all completed for their project, which I think is going to be, they're getting ready to move in in, in March, which is uh, next month. So I've got to finish it up for them and get it delivered probably sometime next week. Had to make up these uh, moldings for the tops of the doors and also a complete door frame, a surround, which I had to build almost like a boat skin. Um, the, I had to build a, a laminating form and laminate beach around the doors, basically. Uh, so it, it would support the doors as a door jam, a uh, custom door jam, and made, and made these moldings to match, which are, are they came out fantastic. I cut the ends, you had to do some mitering work and some sanding and finishing. So, but this is part of the cabinet work that I really am very passionate about. This is where it started at all. Uh, when, like I said, I was a young boy and really got involved with uh, cabinet making um, through uh, influence of a couple of books. Eric Sloan's Reverence for Wood was some book I picked up at a library, man, and it was like, dang, this thing is really cool. He talked about early America and how um, woodworking, uh, cabinet making, and, and timber frame construction and all this stuff, and it was, I was just fascinated. I was like, holy shit, this stuff is really nice uh, and something that I really want to explore more, and I did. And with the support of my family, I, I was able to. It was something that... Um, you know, like I said, I moved out of my bedroom when I was like 12 or 14 years old. Moved into my bedroom from my brother's upstairs and then moved the cabinet shop into my bedroom, which was off the kitchen. Drove my mom crazy. Had my saws going in there all the time. And she just thought I was going to cut my damn fingers off. I still got them all, Ma. And it worked out really good. I really developed skills through the years. I've been at this now. This is 33 years formally in business. Um... The training that I received was just, man, doing it, making your mistakes, paying your dues. That's what it's all about in life. If you <clears throat> make one mistake, you're not going to do it again. It's the same thing in cabinet making and restoration work. You don't do the same thing twice. Now with the internet, uh, the support groups that we have, the professional refinishers group, I mean, amazing bunch of guys. The, the, the talent in this country that we have doing restoration. I mean, it's not a lot of us, but the ones that are there are just phenomenal. Phenomenal teachers, craftsmen, inspiration. I mean, one of the guys who teaches us how to do this stuff, he's the head furniture conservator for the Smithsonian, Don Williams. We go to his workshop down in, in Monterey, Virginia, and he teaches us all week long. Uh, and, you know, we help too. We, we put our two cents in and try and, and support each other through the internet and through the group. So it's a pretty amazing time that we live in now. Um, so this is the shop. You know, it's not really big. Yet I found that it's not the tools that you have. It's how you use your tools. I mean, that's really what it, go, what it boils down to. Your tools allow you to perform work that can be done. Uh, you know, hand tools can be are one way of achieving a certain result. Power tools do it quicker. There is a, a place for each and every aspect of that in cabinet making and restoration. Um, my table saw, bandsaw, router, shaper, uh, sanders, 6x48, drum sanders. Um, there's a lot of tools down here just scattered about. I know it was a cluttered mess, but believe me, it's my organized mess, and I know where everything is. I very efficiently work down here. It's not a big shop. I'm by myself. It works really, really well. Uh, I really can move a lot of furniture through here um, in, in a really timely basis 
and also at a high quality skill level and really put it out there where nobody is touching the restoration work that I'm doing. It's just, it's not cost effective for them. Um, you know, you get to, I got to my point in life where I can do really good quality work quickly um, and do the right things so you don't have to repeat processes. You know what processes are going to work. What are the required steps to get to the product, the end product, the color that you finally want. I mean, this is a blank canvas, these doors. I'm going to color these things that are going to be just beautiful. Uh, and the finish on them is going to go on. It's going to be really durable for these customers. It's part of the deal. Um, when we get involved with uh, furniture, it's from chairs that come in to uh, cabinets that come in. We get some big cabinets over some secretary desks and whatnot. All kinds of neat things like that that come in through the doors. And uh, the, the retail end of it was really good when it worked. And now we're just like involved totally on, um, on uh, restoration work. That's what our focus is on now. To get involved with both, for me, was not a good idea. It was hard to do. I had a hard time going about um, dividing my time up between a really busy retail shop and a very busy restoration studio. And I, uh, it, was, it was almost impossible to maintain. Every time the doorbell rang upstairs, I'm running upstairs, not getting the damn thing done down here, work until you know, 4 in the morning. And I still work till 4 or 5 in the morning, I find, most of the time. But... Uh, I'm by myself. I'm doing it by myself. Yeah, I like it because it's got um, uh, a big, uh, it's quiet time. Uh, this is really focused work. You're, you need that quiet time to get down to what you got to do and, you know, to work and, and put things together. Like if I'm working on a table saw, I don't want somebody disturbing me. I don't want somebody walking in the door, uh, bringing a bu buzzer. I don't want the phone ringing. Um, so it's weird how it works, but it works really well for me. I am very, very happy with my schedule. I'm very, uh, very uh, cost effective. My neighbors don't seem to mind. I don't really have any neighbors here, except my one cool neighbors in the back there, and they just uh, they think they dig me, so I don't have any problems there. I'm in a commercial uh, zone, and it's a it's it's a really fantastic uh, business environment, which I'm very fortunate to, fortunate to have. Um, Old clamps, I mean, as I was saying in the woodworking business, uh, a man never has enough clamps in a cabinet shop, and it's true. I keep adding to my clamp collection. This is, you know, 30 years of clamp uh, clamp collections. I buy clamps as I go along. I'll, I'll see my flea market's garage sales, or, you know, I'll go to an estate and I'll buy some stuff, and there'll be a clamp or something there. I'll pick it up as some really good ones. You know, the workhorse are these Jorgensen 6-inch clamps. They're one of the, probably the, the, the handiest clamps because they're, uh, they're good for laminating. They're good for repair work. I do a lot of veneer repairs. Um, the um, the glues that we use um, are you know they're, they're traditional adhesives. I use high glue. Uh, when the horse went to the glue factory, this is what he ended up in. This is the the glue pot. Poor guy. Uh, but it works. This is how all the furniture was glued since the time of the Egyptians. They're using high glue. It comes in a granular form. And high glue is really fantastic stuff. It is really, really good. It comes in different gram strands. You can use it for really quick grab. If you want to get something to stick real quick, it'll stay there. It's 350, 360 gram strength glue. If you get down to the lower gram strength glues, they don't stick as quickly, but they're stronger. Um, these glues are strong, but they're brittle. I mean, the higher grade gram strength glues. It's just one of the little things you you figure out through life and, and figure out what to do and what not to do. So a high glue, it's got to cook every morning. I put the glue pot on every morning. I, I cook the glue during the day, and I'm using the glue and repl replenishing the pot. And I do go a lot through this. I buy this stuff in 50-pound bags. So you go through a lot of high glue in here. Everything was glued with high glue, and I use only high glue in my restoration process. It's the only way to do it. I mean, if you're going to do something correctly, you got to follow the traditional methods that's got to bring it back to where it was, uh, where, where it needs to be, and survive. We're only timekeepers of this, we're only owners of this furniture for a very short period of time. This stuff's going to travel on through the centuries. It's always going to be here. If the people are willing to keep their furniture alive, I'm willing to do whatever I have to do to make sure that their furniture is going to survive. And you know, be handed down through the generations. What 
we have lost as a society is the ability to hand things down from one generation to the, the next. They're, it's going so quickly, and I feel that a lot of things are kind of lost. Um, from when my customers come in they, and they hand me their grandmom's you know, furniture from, you know, they were married in 1925, and this was a set of furniture that was a wedding gift to them from their parents. And it's really special. I feel honored to be able to work on their heritage, to preserve something that was in their family for all this time. To keep that uh, little keepsake in history, the part of that keeps their family together. And for me to be a part of that, I mean, I deliver furniture and, and people just break down crying. They're like, wow, they, they can't believe that we saved it. And it's, it's really a, it's an emotional experience sometimes for me. I look at this stuff and I'm like, it's just amazing I'm here doing this. And, uh, you know, whatever the powers would be, have kept me doing it. So I, I'm planning on doing it for a long time. Anyway, um, so this is my cabinet making shop. Uh, hope you come back. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye. All right, here's an early chair that came in for restoration work. Um, basically, this chair, the whole crest rail I'm looking at right now, was broken off this chair. All the pieces <laughs> had to be like uh, put back together in such a way that it wouldn't look like it was ever touched. So, I mean, check this out. Look at, look at the joinery on this sucker. I mean, it is pristine, man. Here we go. Look at that focus. Repair work on the seat. This is all original paint. This chair is probably 1830, 1840. Um, right here, in this exact spot, there was a big wire wrapped around it and two big, huge grooves that were carved into it to get purchased. You can see a little shadow where the wire was. So I had to fill this whole area in and match the paint up really carefully. Uh, that was a challenging job. But this is all original milk paint, original surfaces. Look at somebody carved their initials into this thing. That's the kind of cool stuff I love to see. Um, you know, original painted pieces like this are getting harder and harder to find. Uh, and it's hard to keep them in good shape. People want to use these things like a modern chair, and they can't. You have to show these things a certain amount of respect. You gotta sit in them right, you gotta treat them right, you gotta repair them when they're broken. Broken furniture around too long I mean look at this thing it is just all the surfaces are just really really nice this is not a janky chair this thing is beautiful so this is the kind of shit I love to come in the shop man this is stuff that really makes makes my blood go it's wonderful all right check this out Inside a 1912 Indian race motor. Look at this thing. Pinion gear. This pinion gear was bad in here. You can see how thin the thing is. These gear teeth are like potato chips in there. They ain't gonna do anything. See these, this is a, uh, not a new old stock gear, but it hasn't got much use to it. And I've had this right laid around in my shop for a while. Took it out of stock, cleaned it up real nice, and it looks pretty dang nice. The teeth are nice and fat. And you see the difference between these little tiny teeth. This thing is just worn out. So, I'm gonna replace this pinion gear, sits in there like that, with this one right here. I'm gonna polish up the shaft, do my work to it, get a new bearing fitted into the case, and make this thing run really good. This is a race motor, uh, aluminum pistons, um, polished rods, uh, the cases are all been worked. Um, there's the overhead valve units that go on top of that thing. This thing is badass. Now watch this. When you have these pinion gears together, they go into this case right here. This times the motor. You throw this in there, this drops in here. This is what times the valves. All goes in there, bam, look at that. Now watch. This one pinion gear controls all these actions. Look at that. Oil pump, 
timing of the magneto, this times the valves right here. If this gear is bad, then snap, 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 all over the place. Not a good thing. Okay, now, I'm gonna put this in there, get to work. Thank you. He called me in October. He says, hey John, listen, we're gonna run this cannibal run across country, and I got very excited. I was like, really? And I think I was the second or third guy to sign up for it, uh, even before I even knew what bike I was even gonna run. <laughs> Basically, we're going to ride pre-16 motorcycles from one side of the country to the other. A rerun of long-distance races that were run in the early part of the country in record time. I don't know, I think people have a hard time understanding how much you have to do to keep these stupid things running. But I was really hammering this bike wide open all day long, full throttle. But that was the, the third rod in this motorcycle. It's just amazing that I went through three rods and I'm not even halfway across country yet. I helped Sean out with raising up his intake manifold because he was having issues with vibrating loose. Where's that movement coming from? Something's coming loose, but I don't know where it is. 